Good afternoon, everyone. President Kim, Secretary General Bonn, President Kafour, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Andrea Koppel, Vice President of Global Engagement and Policy for the International Humanitarian and Development Organization, Mercy Corps. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome all of you here this afternoon for the third Sanitation and Water for All high-level meeting. If you have any doubt just how far you've come in four short years since the first SWA high-level meeting in 2010, you've only to look at the stage. The fact that two of the world's most powerful and influential statesmen are with us here today speaks volumes about the importance that they place on the work that you're doing here at the high-level meeting and the attention that your work is receiving at the very highest levels of the United Nations and here in the World Bank. So please join me in thanking both of these extraordinarily busy men for joining us here today. Water is central to the work that we as a development community do. It sits at the convergence of poverty, conflict, health, governance, economic growth, and environmental sustainability. It is the resource that has the potential to deepen divides and reinforce inequity or to bring people together. While potable water is bound up in social, political, and economic realities, it is also a finite and precious natural resource that if mismanaged, can become the root of long-term instability. By a show of hands, how many of you here today are from Africa or Asia? Yeah. Well, certainly we don't need to tell any of you that the lack of investment in WASH in many of your countries is responsible for costing your governments between 2 to 6% of your GDP every year. Just imagine what you could do with those additional resources. And as the powerful video that was produced by SWA showed, hundreds, if not thousands of children, the equivalent of plane loads of jumbo jets, die from lack of proper hygiene, sanitation, and water every day, every day. And ladies and gentlemen, this isn't due to some rare or mysterious tropical disease or pancreatic cancer. We can solve this. We have the answers, and we will solve it. Here's a real-time example that my Mercy Corps colleagues are dealing with today as we speak. Is the representative from the Central African Republic here today? Yes. So as you know, sir, the rainy season is beginning. Where as many as 100,000 people have taken refuge at the airport in Bangui in search of safety from the violence that has consumed car for much of the last year. Not surprisingly, clean water and sanitation facilities are few and far between. With the onset of the rainy season, there is a big danger of waterborne diseases like malaria or typhoid affecting these people, especially the young children, because they haven't been inoculated. This is just one country, just one of many that are in urgent need of our help. Preventing children and their parents from becoming ill and dying and increasing GDP lost to insufficient investment in WASH in countries around the world are two excellent reasons for all of us to get up in the morning and go to work. It's something that His Excellency John Kufour, the former president of Ghana and chair of the SWA partnership, thinks about 
every day. President Kufour is a global advocate for leadership, governance, and development. He was also recently appointed by Secretary General Ban to be a, a special envoy on climate change. President Kufour. Many thanks, Madam Moderator, for the introduction. I firmly believe that potable water, sanitation, and hygiene are the most basic necessities for everyone. I also believe that it takes political will and a great convergence of committed stakeholders to fulfill those needs. So I am delighted that we have in this room so many governments, so many ministers, and so many representatives from stakeholders, the United Nations, development banks, civil society organizations, and the private sector. And it is truly wonderful to be at this meeting in the presence of the United Nations Secretary General and the President of the World Bank, both of whom together have incidentally asked me to serve as a special envoy on climate change, an issue with critical overarching importance to mankind's existence on our planet as we know it now. They together with us are increasing the prioritization of WASH, that is water, sanitation, and hygiene, and we are delivering results that will transform the lives of millions, even billions of people around the world. And this is imperative. As we near 2015, we are in a position to act on the urgency of the end of the Millennium Development Goals period, and to look for new opportunities to address unfinished business on the agenda. We must make WASH, in face of the looming threat of climate change, a political priority, indeed a single driving issue for the generation. And we must make sure that we finish the business of making sure that everyone has access to the building block of human development, water, sanitation, and hygiene. I speak from experience. When I was president in Ghana, I strengthened the policies to ensure sanitation, water, and hygiene were paid due attention. This meant solving some of the institutional problems creating dedicated budgets and directorates, but also some very practical actions on the ground, such as making separate toilets and hand washing station, station standard in schools. This protected the health of children and gave girls the opportunity to go to school where there were clean and private facilities. We must not forget the real impact our actions have on the people we serve. Sanitation and water for all is an important mechanism to not just learn from each other, but to also hold ourselves accountable for results. Results that benefit the poorest and most vulnerable people in 2012. In 2012, I concluded the high-level meeting by reminding ourselves that it would be by our actions and not by our words we would be judged. I still stand by that. So I'm pleased that partners will talk today about commitments they have brought and how they will implement them. 
I am looking forward to hearing some concrete practical recommendations today, both in terms of progress on the commitments made at our meeting two years ago and commitments planned for the future. This is truly a momentous meeting, and the growth of the Sanitation and Water for All Partnership is no less momentous. I am honored to preside over it. Not only is the partnership able to convene the, uh, the room of leaders as we see now, but also we are seeing real results at the local level. Government systems are strengthening. More funds are available and they are being used more effectively. We can foresee the day when our name will have become our achievement, sanitation and water for all around the world. And I extend to you a very warm welcome and I thank our distinguished guests, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Dr. Ban Ki-moon, and the President of the World Bank, Dr. Jim Kim, for agreeing to open this meeting. I want to thank all of you. And thank you, Madam uh, Moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Kofor. Ban Ki-moon, as you all know, is the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations and the former South Korean Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Since he stepped into his current role in 2007, the Secretary General has sought to promote sustainable development and to empower women among many of his initiatives. Mr. Secretary General. Thank you. President Kim Young Kim of World Bank, uh, President John Kufu, uh, Special Envoy on Climate Change, Excellencies, Distinguished Ministers, ladies and gentlemen. I'm inspired by this uh, gathering and I thank UNICEF for bringing us together. And I congratulate uh, President John Kufu on his uh, leadership. All of you in this room uh, have the power to improve the lives of millions of people around the world. We are now talking about the water. To me, it seems that uh, there are many different understandings on water. Let me just say as uh, beginning, when uh, rich people use, uh, spend uh, money lavishly, uh, people say, that, well, he's uh, spending money like uh, water. That means water is just uh, nothing. There is uh, one thing. Then water can be also deadly forces. When there's a severe flooding, water can devastate the whole of, of our lives and damages properties. Nothing can beat water. Even fire, people believe that the perception is that fire is a much more deadly force, but fire can be extinguished by water. Then can you see anything stronger than water? In the end, it is the water, which can be very deadly force. As a public service officer, I used to tell to my staff, do it as water flows. That means you do naturally. Water, in normal cases, never confronts people. Just when there are rocks, it just avoids rock and flows smoothly. When it has to really roll the rock, then it shows a force. That means when it is absolutely necessary, you have to show your commitment and strong leadership. This is a water. Then as a Secretary General of the United Nations, when I visit many countries, African countries, where 
people are really struggling uh, to have uh, just a bucket of water. I say water is life. And that has been my always consistent message. Water is life. Now we are now talking about our life, water. And I really appreciate uh, your strong commitment. The United Nations takes this water and sanitation as one of the important uh, priorities. Uh, my Deputy Secretary General, uh, he has been chairing this water and sanitation, and he has been a member of this. I really appreciate your strong commitment in water. Water can save our lives. Water can work as our lifeline. Water, sanitation, and hygiene are fundamental to human development and progress across the Millennium Development Goals. When people have better access to sanitation and water, they are healthier, of course, and they can also work more productively, live more fully, and contribute more to society. You are part of a push for advancement that is succeeding around the world. In just over two decades, more than two billion people saw improvements in their water supply. We reached that MDG target, but we are not stopping until we help the remaining two and two and a half a billion people who still lack adequate sanitation. We are especially concerned about 100, uh, 1 billion people who are forced to practice open defecation. Our partnership aims to provide war of sanitation and hygiene to all people wherever they live and no matter how limited their resources are. The Sanitation and Water for All initiative can meet needs and it can also contribute to human rights. If we reach our goals, we will correct inequalities between rich and poor, cities and the countryside, and men and women whose health is especially vulnerable to poor sanitation. Uh, today's gathering uh, can be a turning point the momentum is already building. Two years ago at the Sanitation and Waterfall meeting, participants made more than 400 concrete commitments. Since then, a fifth of those commitments have been met and there, are, there have been good progress on many others. I applaud all of you who contributed, who contributed to that success. You bring impressive commitment and rich experience to our global campaign. This is a diverse group of public health, development, and finance officials. You have different areas of expertise, but you can all see the value of sanitation and water for all. The benefits cut across health and the economy. Action will empower individuals and drive progress across the society. There are three components of success. First, smart investment. We agree that spending on sanitation and waterfall is wise. Our challenge is to do this in a way that is smart. Resources are scarce with the right allocations. We can optimize the funds and reach all people in the world. Second, firm commitment. We need strong institutions to reach people living in slums and remote areas and to make sure that services last. Our collective commitment will push us to the finish line in reaching the MDGs. And together, we can make sure that water, sanitation, and hygiene are integral to the post-2015 development agenda. Third, staunch advocacy. Funding and commitment are important, but we also need awareness. It's not always comfortable to talk about sensitive hygiene matters. 
Open defecation used to be a taboo topic, but we are speaking up to save lives. The United Nations is proud to have played a part in starting the conversation. In 2010, the General Assembly passed the resolution on closing the sanitation gap. To build on this, we issued a call to action on sanitation with my Deputy Secretary General Jan Eliasson in the lead. As you know, he chaired SWA meeting in 2012. We are now launching a communication campaign to eradicate and inspire uh, the public to take up the cause of ending open defecation. We welcome the support of all partners, including the World Bank. I look forward to hearing from Dr. Kim on its work. Around the world, the United Nations is supporting water, sanitation, and hygiene projects. UNICEF works in more than 100 countries to bring these essential services to people. The World Health Organization, the UNDP, and other agencies are taking action around the world. We are operating even in refugee camps, disaster areas, and other insecure environments where people most struggle to cope. In all of our efforts, we benefit from the valuable contributions of the Advisory Board on Water and Sanitation. I thank, uh, even though he's not here, His Royal Highness Prince El Hassan bin Talal for his uh, strong leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an extraordinary alliance. A sanitation and waterfall brings together governments, donors, development banks, UN agencies, and civil society. This meeting can generate the push we need uh, for a major advance on sustainable development. Achieving sanitation and waterfall may not be cost free, but it will set people free. Access to sanitation and water means a child free of disease, a woman free of backbreaking core uh, to fetch water, a girl free to attend school without fear, a village free of cholera, and a world of greater equality and dignity for all. And I thank you for your commitment. Thank you. Mr. Secretary General, thank you so much. Our next speaker, Dr. Jim Yong Kim, is the 12th president of the World Bank. Both a medical doctor and an anthropologist, President Kim is also the first bank leader whose professional background is not in the political or financial sectors. Instead, Dr. Kim spent two decades of his career working to improve health these very same issues in many of the countries here today. Mr. President. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, uh, uh, Your Excellency, uh, Foreign President John Kufour, and uh, Excellencies, I, I want to welcome you all here uh, to the International um, uh, uh, Finance Corporation, our private sector uh, part of our, our, uh, our work. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful that we're here today to prevent the needless deaths of millions of people, most of them poor children, who die because of lack of sanitation. Today, 2.5 billion people do not have access to functioning toilets, causing 700,000 deaths each year. Over 400 million school days are lost each year. Girls and women are more likely to drop out of school because they lack toilets and risk assault when going out in open areas. There are also staggering economic impacts, not only from poor health and morbidity, but also from environmental and indus industrial losses. These economic losses are an estimated $260 billion per year. In Niger, losses account for 2.4% of GDP annually, and in India, they account for 6.4% 6 6 of GDP. 
Last year, we announced two ambitious goals for the World Bank Group, to end p extreme poverty by 2030 and to boost shared prosperity for the poorest 40 percent in developing countries. We cannot achieve these goals if we don't help our clients fix sanitation, which is directly linked to poverty. While the challenge is massive, I'm optimistic. We know the lack of access to adequate sanitation is fundamentally a failure of service de delivery and the poor suffer the most. To fix the problem, we have to take a rigorous and systematic approach to delivering on our promises, what we've been calling a science of delivery. But it will also require greater financing. In the last seven years, the World Bank has committed, on average, over $3 billion a year to water and sanitation. Going forward, I hope we can do more. Not only in the magnitude of financing, but also in how this financing is used to reach the poorest. Each dollar we invest in sanitation has an economic return of more than five dollars. The World Bank Group is committed to doing our part, both in financing and in improving delivery. Our new senior director of the water practice, uh, Junaid Kamal Ahmed. Junaid, can you stand up, please? Thank you. He will work closely with all of you to develop a plan for sustained global focus and commitment towards sanitation and water for all. We'll work with leaders on a whole of government approach, teaming up with ministers of education to put sanitation facilities in every school, with ministers of health to add sanitation to health and nutrition programs, and with ministers of agriculture, the environment, and urban planning to include basic sanitation in their plans and programs that target the poor. And we'll support this through a complementary One World Bank Group approach, working across all global practices, leveraging our ex expertise in a range of sectors, including the private sector where we sit today. The entire purpose of the reorganization of the World Bank can be brought down to this fundamental issue. If we remain in our silos and think of water separate from all the other issues that uh, uh, come together to provide good delivery, then we would be failing you. So the promise we're making to each one of you today is that not only will we uh, uh, help you with your water and sanitation problem, but we will link the work in that field with everything else we do across um, uh, your countries. We will broaden stakeholder engagement, including with leaders from the private sector, as I mentioned. And you would be surprised at how eager the private sector players are uh, in, in wanting to understand their piece of the puzzle and to contribute to uh, the science of delivery, as we call it. We're already in discussion with companies about how to better mobilize private sector financing and knowledge to improve sanitation. We'll strengthen our role in creating and sharing knowledge, working with all our public private sector and private sector partners and with civil society. The experience of NGOs like BRAC in Bangladesh and Kenya Water for Health Organization can give us valuable insights. The United Nations has laid important groundwork, and I want to also recognize the, uh, uh, the great leadership of Deputy Secretary General Jan Eliasson and also the uh, Executive Director of UNICEF, Tony Lake, who are both of whom are with us here today. The United Nations has laid important groundwork to raise global awareness and set goals around this critical issue. We'll leverage our combined strength and align with other partners like Wallet, Water Aid, Toilet Hackers, the Global Poverty Project, the End Water, po End Water Poverty Group, the One Drop Foundation, and many more. You, the finance ministers, have been absent from this conversation for too long. We want to ensure that you have the resources to prioritize sanitation in your country and that other ministries have the skills and knowledge they need to succeed. But today, we need ministries of finance to lead on sanitation. Our country directors are waiting to hear from you and look forward to helping you make access to sanitation services a priority. If we make smart investments in sanitation, we can boost incomes and economies and save millions of lives in just a few years. I look forward to working with all of you to make it happen. Thank you.
I apologize to everyone. Please, the meeting will continue, but we're, we will, we're having to uh, go to another event. Uh, one of 53 for me today. Thank you so much, President Kim and Secretary General Bunn. Uh, Your Excellencies, before we move on to, to our next, the next segment of our program, I just wanted to give you a quick overview so you have uh, an appreciation for the flow of the afternoon. Um, I'll be handing things over in a moment to the Executive Director of UNICEF, Mr. Tony Lake. Uh, following his remarks, we're going to have the pleasure of two keynote addresses, one from a member of the high-level meeting delegation and the other from the chief economist of the World Bank for the Middle East and North Africa region. Following those presentations, I will hand off the baton to the Deputy Secretary General, Jan Eliasson, uh, who will uh, then lead an hour-long conversation focused on the progress made against uh, the various commitments from 2012. Uh, and uh, then he will uh, also talk about your commitments uh, for 2014. And then the final segment will be up here on the stage with four distinguished panelists uh, who will have, will have a conversation about uh, the relationship between governments and the private sector and uh, many of our donors. So with that, uh, President Kafour and I will now take our place at the head of the table. So if you'll just give us one moment. Thank you. Okay, so our, <laughs> hello again. Uh, our next speaker, Mr. Tony Lake, has dedicated his entire life to public service. During that time, he's held some of the highest offices in the US government and since 2010 at UNICEF. And as the executive director will be quick to tell you himself, his present job is one of the best he's ever had. And we are so fortunate he's there, Mr. Lake. Thank you, Andrea, and if you will not repeat this to my former colleagues in the U.S. government, it is the best job that I ever had. Uh, let me first thank the World Bank Group. Let me first thank the World Bank Group uh, for hosting this event. Um, and let me say that uh, every one of us in this room clearly has a deep commitment to our common cause. And what I'm looking forward to in this discussion, then, is this opportunity to translate uh, that commitment into a practical daily reality for millions and millions of people around the world. And I'm looking forward to the discussion very much. Let me first uh, make just a few brief points. WASH is a basic human right, uh, and it's essential to all development outcomes. But when WASH-related diarrheal diseases claimed the lives of more than 500,000 children last year due to poor sanitation, poor hygiene, or unsafe drinking water, when 165 million children around the world suffer from stunting, which is often caused by uh, these diseases in the earliest years, when children, and especially girls, are denied an education and dignity because their schools lack proper sanitation facilities. When poor sanitation and inadequate water supplies result in a loss of 1.5% of annual GDP annually. Just think of that, 1.5%. We must, all of us, face the fact that despite the progress, and there has been progress, too many are being denied this basic right and too many development opportunities are therefore being wasted. The poorest 
and the most disadvantaged are the hardest hit. Far too often, where people live and their incomes determine their access to clean water and improved sanitation and hygiene. New data shows how inequitable progress has been the cause of populations already grappling with poverty and lack of access to health care, medicine, nutrition, and protection, and they are the ones paying the highest price. Nine out of 10 people practicing open defecation live in rural areas. Sanitation coverage in rural areas without roads can be half that enjoyed by rural areas with roads. In Sub-Saharan Africa, more than 91% of the richest in urban areas enjoy improved sanitation and in the poorest rural areas, just 15%. And rapid urbanization has seen the number of people without proper sanitation grow since 1990 by over 180 million people. And yet the economic gains from investing in sanitation and water are huge. As President Kim said, an estimated $260 billion annually in low and middle income countries. The message is clear. We must continue to push for universal access to water, sanitation, and hygiene for all children, no matter where they live and no, what, no matter what barriers stand in the way. Because when WASH improves for every person, lives are saved, nations become healthier, and economies grow stronger. Just imagine for a moment, let's get beyond the statistics, imagine for a moment a 12-year-old girl who can actually go to school because she no longer has to walk over an hour every day to fetch water. Nor does she have to miss school during her menstruation or fear being followed or assaulted because her school now has clean girls-only toilets. The results of this for her, her chances of infection and disease are greatly reduced because she now wash her hands after she uses the toilet. By staying in school, she's more likely to earn a decent wage in the future to support her family and less likely to be married early and become a mother far too early. So WASH is not just about sanitation, it's about health, education, economics, and children's rights. And so a very important point is my sister Margaret Chan, yes, uh, of WHO, as you all know, uh, here would also tell you we won't make progress on other development goals, such as in, especially in health, perhaps, without progress on WASH. There are clear links, for example, between WASH and nutrition. Imagine a stunted boy who suffers from this irreversible affliction. He's shorter than he should be. He's behind his peers in cognitive ability. He's less likely to learn and to earn in the future all from unsafe water or lack of hygiene that caused the diarrhea or the environmental enteropathy, words I never thought I would use 10 years ago, which led to vital nutrients not being absorbed and maintained by his body. Investments in WASH can prevent this, as India is proving. India has an estimated 61 million stunted children. That's about almost one out of every two children uh, in India. So its government is taking action. India is now improving compliance rates for hand washing with soap and delivery rooms prior to initial breastfeeding. And is providing group hand washing facilities in 300,000 schools to complement the government funded midday meal program. We're also seeing progress in Mali where a Gates Foundation study or supported study of programs to improve access to private latrines and reduce open defecation found a 26% reduction in stunting uh, as a result of this work uh, in WASH. So we won't make progress on WASH without putting it high on the global agenda. The post-2015 agenda should include a vision of universal access to water, sanitation, and hygiene. Otherwise, we'll continue falling short of achieving progress in health, nutrition, education, and gender equality. So today's meeting is a chance for governments and donors and NGOs and international organizations and private sector partners to support this agenda with tangible, tangible actions on the ground and to learn from each other and build the broad support required to carry it out. So thank you for being a part of this effort and thank you thus for your commitment to the world's children. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Executive Director Lick. Uh, and now I'd like to turn the microphone over to our first keynote speaker, Dr. Shanta Devarajan, who is the Chief Economist here at the World Bank uh, of the Middle East and North Africa region. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, among some old friends and some new ones uh, to talk about a very, very important topic, as some of the previous speakers have mentioned. But I, I want to start with a puzzle. Um, that, that, you know, now we've heard, we've got a lot of rigorous evidence that, product, that sanitation can be one of the most productive investments you can make for the reasons that some of the previous speakers have identified. It prevents diarrhea in children, and if you can prevent diarrhea in children, you can also help address undernutrition, the thing that Tony Lake just mentioned, among children. And if children are better nourished, they actually learn more, their cognitive skills improve, they're actually healthier as adults, and they actually earn more um, as, as, as workers. So in, in short, the, you know, the benefits of sanitation investments are huge. The cost-benefit analyses show that uh, the, the rates of return on sanitation investment is somewhere between 17 and 55%. The benefit-cost ratio varies from about two to eight. And so the benefits are about two to eight times the, the cost. So the puzzle is why when you, all this evidence, rigorous evidence about the benefits of sanitation, uh, the enormous benefits of sanitation, we still have 470 million people in East Asia. We have 600 million people in Africa and a billion people in South Asia without sanitation. In fact, I. Uh, wrote a blog post once, uh, you know that there are, more, uh, there are more cell phones than toilets in Africa today, uh, uh, just to give you an, an indication. <coughs> now this is a puzzle for a couple of reasons, because first of all, at the individual level, you know, no one cares about their children more than their parents. So why aren't the parents making these investments? And you know, some people say, well, they don't know, they, they, they haven't read all these studies about the benefits, but you know, I, I think we shouldn't underestimate the knowledge that people have. You know, we, they used to say that about education too, that parents don't send their children to school uh, because they don't know the value of education. That's completely not true. Uh, poor people, li illiterate people, have a better understanding of the value of education for their children than literate middle class uh, people. Now, it could be that people don't have money, poor people by definition uh, don't have as much money, but remember, you know, they're making choices about it, spending what little money they have on lots of other things, and again, if the benefits are so huge, why aren't they spending it on, on, uh, uh, on sanitation? But then you can turn it around the other way, and that's where those of you in the room come in. Why aren't governments investing in sanitation? I mean, how many investments have you made that have a rate of return of 55% based on rigorous, rigorous evidence, right? Uh, the, 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 this looks like a, a, a no-brainer for, for a government. My contention is that the, the resolution to this puzzle is that actually this is not the evidence that's relevant to the problem of sanitation. Because I'm sure as ministers of finance or secretaries of finance or sometimes as a chief economist, uh, you're, uh, you're uh, besieged by various sectoral groups that come and say, you've got to do more in my sector. You've got to spend in my sector because the rates of return are huge. <laughs> you know, so you hear this from, I get you know, delegations from electricity, from transport, from uh, manufacturing and everywhere else. And I think that's not the point. The point is, that government, governments have scarce resources. So they should spend those scarce resources on things that the private sector would not spend on. Because that's the only way you can actually make a, a, a sensible choice among the different competing ends. And that's where, it, you know, it, it, to use a sort of economist term, they should spend it on ex goods that have an externality. The classic example being sorry, pollution, where the individual who pollutes has, it does not bear the costs. And so if government spends on ad addressing pollution, you can actually make society better off. But the private sector does not have an incentive to do it because they're not bearing the costs. Now sanitation, or its uh, converse, open defecation, is a classic externality. 
when you, when, when you openly defecate, I don't know, what, is that the way you say it? Uh, you are actually imposing a cost on the rest of the community. Not just to yourself, not even just to your children. But other people, because it goes into the water system, it goes into the food chain, and other people get the bacteria, and then their children are sick, and their children are, are, are undernourished. So, uh, and now we have some evidence, not the ones that I was citing earlier, but there is some really interesting work that calculates this externality. There are studies in, in uh, Maharashtra of the village level sanitation program that shows that w when you had a village level sanitation program, there are ch children in, uh, from households that did not use latrines whose health improved because the neighbors were using latrines. In fact, they've, they've quantified it in rural, in this is for rural India as a whole, the, the, the reduction in diarrhea incidence for households that didn't use latrines was half of the reduction of the households that did use latrines. So you get a 50% reduction as an externality, right? This is huge. This is massive. And this is the strongest case for public spending on sanitation. It's not those high rates of return, it's the externality. And this is what governments should be, should be focusing on. Indeed, I would say, and this is not a, you know, I hope you don't think this is sort of economist fine, you know, uh, fine tuning or something esoteric. This is really fundamental because I think neglecting the externality aspects of sanitation can lead to some real disasters. Because you, you, as, as you know, as finance ministers, you would know that you're under a lot of political pressure to spend on lots of things. And if we spend on private goods, if governments spend on private goods, that crowds out what he could spend on public goods like sanitation. And the point is that private goods are enjoyed. You know, when the government provides private goods for free or very low cost, that's enjoyed by people who may not be poor. And people who aren't poor or people who are rich can be politically very powerful. And they will lobby to keep those private goods at the expense of sanitation for the poor who have a very little voice. So you've got a political system that, 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 that combines with the, these private goods to conspire against the sanitation system. And we have to fight that. And let me just, you know, let me be, I realize that one of the previous speakers is a physician, but this is, this is actually in the, health, in the health field, this is a real crucial problem because most health spending is on curative care, which is a private good. And the amount that's spent on, on sanitation is tiny compared to that. But remember, there's a very powerful lobby of physicians and the non-poor who want to keep that spending going. And again, the losers are the poor who miss out on sanitation uh, spending. The other reason why you might actually go wrong if you don't take this externality into account is in the delivery of sanitation services, what Jim Kim was uh, referring to earlier as well. There was a program in, in India, a sanitation program, which, which was giving out free toilets to people. And diarrheal incidence wasn't going down, right? And what they found was these people who got these free toilets were not using them, shall we say, for the purposes to which they were intended. They were using it for grain storage. One woman used it as her prayer room, right? But none of them, I mean, they, didn't, they weren't using it <laughs> for, for, for the uh, very purpose and the open defecation just continued to go on. Meanwhile, just to the east in, in, in Bangladesh, there was a very successful sanitation program, the total sanitation program, run by an NGO financed by the government. And so they were trying to understand what was the difference? How come this program was working and the other one doesn't? Well, it turned out in Bangladesh, what they did was they didn't give out free toilets to individuals. They gave it to the community and told the community, you give out the toilets to the households. And this way, they internalized the externality because the community actually has an interest in making sure all the people in the community use the toilets for the purposes to which they were intended because then the community as a whole is better off. And now, thankfully, in, uh, in Maharashtra, 
they, 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 so there was technology transfer from Bangladesh to uh, India, um, uh, and, and now they have adopted the community-based sanitation program in, uh, in Maharashtra. And I'm pleased to say that there was, the good news is that Maharashtra now has a very successful total sanitation program, so much so that now there's a sign in these villages saying, we will not give our daughters in marriage to someone from a village that doesn't practice total sanitation. So my conclusion is that there's a strong case for public spending on sanitation, but it isn't on just aggregating the economic effects, it's on the externality. And we have to focus on that. We need to do more work on measuring this externality. This 50% is one number, but we should be verifying it. But also we have to use the externality argument to buttress the political pressure to continue to spend on private goods uh, and be able to, 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 to uh, make the case for, for sanitation on sound economic principles. And we need to keep this externality in mind when we implement the program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Devarajan. Our second keynote speaker is the Honorable Sufian Ahmed, the Ethiopian Minister of Finance and Economic Development. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to speak at this important meeting. I strongly believe that this meeting, which brings together governments, donors, civil society organization and development partner will be a decisive milestone to collectively break down the critical barrier to achieving sustainable sanitation and drinking water for everyone in the world. It is also an honor for me to deliver this keynote address and share Ethiopia's experience with the sector-wide approach and the effective use of public finance to accelerate progress on water and the sanitation. I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity. Over the last decade, the government of Ethiopia has been striving to make a sustainable progress toward poverty reduction and the sustainable development with a vision of building Ethiopia's renaissance. To set the necessary basis for inclusive and sustainable development with its all three dimension, Ethiopia has been registering a sustained double digit economic growth during the last decade, which makes the country one of the few non-oil producing countries experience such rapid economic growth. Currently, we are on a promising trajectory to achieve most of the MEDGs as well as realizing our vision of becoming low carbon emission middle income country within a decade. Excellencies, the government of Ethiopia has put guaranteeing full access to the basic social services and infrastructural amenities to all at the heart of its proper growth strategy. To implement the strategy, more than 65% of the public expenditure has been spent on pro-poor sectors, such as education, health, agriculture, rural roads, energy, and the world, and the water and the sanitation. Ethiopia recognizes water and the sanitation not only as an economic good, but also as a basic right of all human beings to have access to clean water and the sanitation at an affordable price. As clearly outlined in our constitutions, all persons have the right to live in a clean and a healthy environment and uh, to the extent the country's resource permits, policies shall aim to provide all Ethiopians access to public health and education, clean water, housing, food, and the social security. To realize this broader objective, my government has implemented comprehensive policies, strategies, and programs. The National Water Resource Management Policy laid out a framework for to implement community-based water supply, sanitation, and hygiene intervention in an integrated manner. To further elaborate, the Water and the Sanitation Universal Access pla Plan was formally established. The WASH Memorandum of Understanding was also signed in 2006 to provide an integrated institutional framework 
or wash service delivery at regional, at federal, regional, district, and the community level. The WASH Memorandum of Understanding and the Universal Access Plan together provided a much needed foundation for national WASH program for both government and the development partner. And it also served as an important milestone in the context of donor alignment and harmonization. Moreover, the country's successive medium-term plan, such as plan for accelerated sustainable development to end poverty and the ongoing growth in the tra transformation plan, reaffirmed the government's commitment to extend water and the sanitation services to underserved households and the population at large. The plan set a target far more ambitious that the MDGs. It aims at increasing urban and rural potable water coverage to 198% by the end of 2015, respectively. It also targets to reach 100% access to sanitation by 2015. In addition to providing the necessary institutional and the policy framework, the government reinstated its commitment by allocating significant amount of resources to achieve the, univera, the universal access plan of, of access plan. Over the past few years, resource flow to the wash sector from all sources have been rising steadily, growing by about 400% in the five years from 2003 to 2008. The government provides the single largest source of funds through a federal block grant channeled directly to regions and the districts. The sector also receives funds from a large number of diverse sources and through an equally wide range of channels. As a result of the high priority given and the several simultaneous efforts made by the governments, NGOs, development partners, and the communities to address the challenge in the sector Ethiopia has made a remarkable progress toward achieving universal access to water and sanitation. Starting from a very low base of 19% for water supply and only 3% for sanitation coverage in 1990, the overall access to water supply and the sanitation facilities have expanded to 68.45% and 67% in the fiscal year 2012-2013, respectively. During the last Ethiopian fiscal year alone, additional 10 million people got access to potable water from the expansion of water supply coverage. Despite the progress, however, the sector is not without a challenge. Some of the challenges faced by the sector includes capacity and the human resource issues, high government staff turnover, geographical inequalities, operation and the maintenance issues, lack of water well drilling equipment and the technical expertise, delays related to offshore procurements, donor fragmentation, and the lack of coordination and the lack of strong contractors working in the sector. Withstanding the challenge faced, I believe that the following key success factors and the lessons learned, which were determining factor of the progress achieved so far are worth mentioning and uh, to share with you. First, the commitment of the government to achieving the goal set nationally and internationally is a critical factor. In Ethiopia, this has been manifested in many ways such as the provision in the constitution, the inclusion of the sector in the main pillar of successive medium-term plans, continuously increasing trends of allocation of public funds, and the creation of a strong coordination mechanism. Second, it is apparent that if WASH program is going to be successful in a sustainable way, Countries must ensure that they have technical capability and the institutions that produce 
technical experts at the required level, quantity, and the quality. Thus, it is important to develop and invest a minimum package for wash capacity at sub-national level, and this should be linked to the achievement of the universal access plan and the sustaining the services provided. Investment in capacity also needs to be linked to a minimum investment for the development of sustainable wash infrastructure. In this context, there is a need to invest in the establishment of sustainable, sustainable supply chain to ensure wash costs and the local private sector mechanics have ready access to fast moving spare parts for operation and the maintenance. The third critical factor from, ex from our experience for a sustained progress toward reaching universal access is harmonization of efforts. Given the importance of the sector, there is a huge presence of development partners supporting the effort of the government. Therefore, it is very critical to ensure harmonization of donor rules and the procedures in terms of planning, implementation, reporting, monitoring, and evaluations. However, our experience shows that it is not an easy task to bring donors to a consolidated pool funding and the joint program arrangements, as some development partners still prefer to operate in project model using their own rules and the procedures, in which each modality has its own system for budgeting, planning, implementation, and the reporting. This situation is highly inefficient and the most importantly weakens much of the limited capacity available. To address this issue, the government in agreement with development partners has already established a consolidated one WASH program in the WASH account to finance and implement one national program with aligned, harmonized, and integrated mechanism in partnership with all external financiers, NGOs, and the private sectors. As you know, the water, sanitation, and hygiene program is multi-sectoral in nature, and the several sectors are implementing some of the components of the, of the program. Ensuring effective coordination among governmental and the non-governmental institutions and the sectors is a precondition for the successful implementation of the program. Therefore, establishing all inclusive and the transparent coordination mechanism is among the key lessons that are worth noting. In Ethiopia, the 2006 WASH Memorandum of Understanding between the water, health, and the education sectors and the one national WASH program were a great step forward for coordination, investment planning, and implementations. Finally, addressing inequalities in, is a vital area where we should be critically mindful. If a country is going to achieve universal access, the disparities that may exist in various parts of a country needs to be addressed. Cognizant of this fact, the government of Ethiopia has given more emphasis to developing regional states with packages specific and compatible to the situation of the regions. Distinguished delegates, the progress we made so far is not only the result of government's effort, it is a result of unconstrained effort from our development partners, NGOs, and the community itself. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate and thank them all for the progress we have made so far. In conclusion, although we are well on track to meet the MEDG target on water and the san sanitation, there is a lot more needed to be done to achieve the universal access plan. So far, only less than half of the resource needed to reach this goal has been committed. But being here today, seeing the commitment and the enthusiasm in this very room with this diverse and the prestigious group, I am convinced that we will undoubtedly deliver our commitments. I thank you very much.
Mr. Minister, thank you so much. Uh, and now it's time to hear from all of you about the achievements that you've made over the last two years and about your future commitments. To moderate the next hour is the Deputy Secretary General, Jan Eliasson, who I had the pleasure of getting to know many years ago when he was the exceptional ambassador from Sweden to the United States and later Sweden's foreign minister. As you know, he's held many other important roles over the years. Mr. Deputy Secretary General. Thank you very much, Andrea, and ministers, uh, colleagues, uh, dear friends, it's great to be with you. I can tell you it's uh, homecoming. Uh, I was moderating this uh, debate uh, two years ago, and uh, uh, John Kufor was in the room, Tony Lake was in the room, uh, Barbara Frost was in the room, uh, several of you ministers were in the room, and I can tell you that was the best meeting I have ever attended on the water and sanitation issue. Why? Probably because we were such a diverse group, and particularly we were, you were there, the ministers of finance, ministers of sanitation, ministers of economic planning, who could go home to your governments, to your countries, and uh, send the message about the importance of sanitation, both from the perspective of the right thing to do, but also the enlightened self-interest, as we heard from the chief economists of the World Bank right now. And uh, then also in the room, we had all the actors there who could uh, gather around the problem. We should try to start to think and work horizontally and not vertically. We s live too far too much in silos. We have to go across the board and s put the problem in the center and then ask who can do something about it. And that is why that meeting two years ago was so good. So Lekhanov and, and others all talk so much about that. I'm so glad that we now do it again. And the reason why I can continue to be very satisfied looking back at that meeting is that so many of the commitments made at that meeting and uh, subsequently, I think around 400 commitments, out of these 400 commitments, uh, 80 are fully, fully uh, achieved, uh, 160 are about to be achieved and uh, work on progress on uh, several others. And these, this sort of concreteness is what I think this meeting brings to the work on our water uh, uh, and the whole wash sector. And it, this has been one of the most uh, neglected areas. You, you, it's not absolutely unbelievable that, that uh, sanitation is the most lagging of the goals in spite of the obvious, uh, obvious benefits. The benefits is not only for water and for the wash sector and health, it's also for education, gender equality, extreme poverty, child mortality, child, child mortality, uh, the, uh, inst the stunting of children. Uh, you can go across the, the whole development agenda and you see the benefits. So therefore, uh, I really hope that this becomes a strong, vital tradition, this type of meeting, and that we realize that we have uh, uh, still a job to do. This glass of water, tap water, probably could be taken from the uh, toilets out here, uh, is a luxury still for 768 million people. 2.5 billion without sanitation and 1.1 billion uh, practicing open defecation. 2,000 children under the age of five dying every day. The reason I got involved in this 20 years ago when I was the emergency relief coordinator uh, for the UN was that I saw children die in front of me, diarrhea and dysentery and dehydration. And this must stop, and I think we can do it. And uh, I, I don't want, I, had a, I have a written script, and I'm telling my colleagues, sorry, I want to get hear from you instead. <laughs> and we have, uh, uh, we have, I've been advised by the Secretariat that there are <coughs> a number of, of uh, member states here, and also <coughs> one or two NGOs and the Bill and Gates, uh, Melinda Gates Foundation that have offered to give comments, but I would really ask you to do something extraordinary, and that is to uh, speak for, let's say, two minutes and as interactively as possible so that we can finish by, uh, Andrea has promised that we could go on until at the latest five past four, so we have, we have 50 minutes left. And I, I will start uh, with a person who uh, I think can give, speak on behalf of several, uh, and that is uh, my friend, since I was in Nigeria only two weeks ago, we spoke, spoke about this hour, I hope I think I can say that we are friends. Uh, the President of the African Minister's Council on Water, 
the Minister of Water Resources for the, for, of Nigeria, Sarah Rang Okepke, because you have now followed this meeting yesterday with the sector ministerial meeting, and you have listened to the country commitments, and I would like to ask you uh, whether you could give us the highlights uh, in possibly that tremendous challenge of a couple of minutes so that we then would listen to at least uh, 12, 13 other of the colleagues around the table. Sarah, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, the Deputy Secretary General, Your Excellencies, um, delegations led by Ministers of Water and Sanitation in Africa, Asia, and Latin America met yesterday to share progress on the 2012 commitments and make new pledges. Following national consultations, 44 countries made 265 commitments to accelerate and improve sanitation, hygiene, and water service delivery. Sector ministers endorsed a bold vision of universal access to WASH set within a broader vision of economic growth. Commitments set ambitious national targets and established new commitments for eliminating open defecation. Responding to your call to action about half the countries pledged to eliminate open defecation by 2025. Achieving national targets demand better targeting of investments to accelerate progress on sanitation and hygiene. To this end, 60% of countries committed to increase sector financing from domestic sources. Ministers also recognize the imperative to reduce growing inequalities. Sustainability depends on strong institutions at national and local levels. Nearly two-thirds two of countries made practical commitments to increase the capacity of sector institutions. Many made, made pledges to improve coordination between sectors. Ministerial pledges contain a rich set of ideas that provide better incentives to build systems that last and change attitudes to sanitation and hygiene. Delivering this rich set of commitments requires partnership. We need finance ministers to recognize the value of investing in sanitation, hygiene, and water. We also ask donors to commit to a much closer alignment to our national plans. Please join us to turn these commitments into reality. I thank you very much. I thank you very much for uh, these uh, 265 commitments and also that you have uh, looked into the area of uh, priority setting and sector financing. But I also think another issue is how we build up institutions and legal structures to deal with the uh, water and uh, sanitation and, uh, and uh, the open defecation uh, challenges. And uh, therefore, I would like to turn to Minister Amara Kone. We talked about fragility of states yesterday. Now, if you could, he if we could hear from you about what your president uh, and your government has established, namely a national water resources and sanitation board. Uh, I wonder how your government will ensure uh, that this is an effective and sustainable uh, uh, body that will, will help our efforts. If you could, uh, Mr. Minister, elaborate on that for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Secretary General, distinguished colleagues uh, and delegates. Uh, that's correct. Our president, as you know, is water ambassador. Uh, we've set up the board, which she chairs, and it has uh, the Ministry of Lands, Mines, and, and Energy, the Ministry of Public Works, the Ministry of Finance, the water company, and you know several water NGOs in the country. We are in the process of you know formulating our uh, budget for next fiscal year, water and sanitation has taken a priority place uh, in that process. Uh, that draft budget will be reviewed by our cabinet, chaired by the president, uh, next Friday, and then for onward submission to the national legislature. The goal is that the government will provide funding for the work of this board and increase funding to the WASH sector. But we ask uh, the international community to uh, assist in the process because of our limited uh, fiscal space. So the commitment is there. I think uh, setting up the board uh, is the first step. 
the financing through our budget will be increased and we will work with our development partners to raise additional resources. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is really turning interactive, isn't it? Now we'll uh, turn to uh, Justin Greening, uh, another friend, the Secretary <coughs> of State for International Development of the UK. I, I know that you proposed a big scale-up of WASH at the last high-level meeting. This shows how much we remember what was being said at this meeting. Uh, and uh, could you let us know about your uh, progress? And uh, can you tell us about what your main priorities are going forward, uh, setting that higher priority? Sure, thank you, uh, Mr. Elias. And we did indeed, uh, two years ago in this forum, commit to uh, investing in this area. We committed to support 60 million people to get access to improved water, sanitation, and hygiene by December 2015. And today I can confirm that the UK is on track to meet our commitment that we made. We're delivering most of the results through our bilateral programs in 17 countries, and we've scaled up our work in Ethiopia, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Zimbabwe. And indeed, last autumn, we started a new program with UNICEF to reach 5 million people across about nine countries. And today I'm announcing three new partnerships with consortiums of NGOs and private companies led by Oxfam, Plan International, and SMV. And these programs will reach about 4.7 million people. I think, as it's been said, this is important because we should also, at this time, be looking to the future to understand how we can make sure that water and sanitation is addressed in the next post-2015 development <coughs> framework and the UK government strongly endorses the report of the high-level panel which very much emphasized the need to focus on water and sanitation. Uh, in terms of uh, our priorities, I'd like to briefly mention three key issues that we think are central for better water and sanitation services. First of all, uh, reaching women and girls. Secondly, ensuring sustainable investments. And then thirdly, improving development effectiveness. As we've heard, improved water and sanitation is critical for women and girls. Um, it's women and girls who are carrying water to their homes, often from distant sources, who are put at risk of sexual and other violence because they don't have a toilet at home and have to venture out after dark. And I think if we want to improve opportunities for women and girls, which is certainly something that's at the heart of DFID's work, then getting access to water and sanitation services is vital. Secondly, we're very keen as a priority to make sure that investments are sustainable, and that means being able to be sure that services can be paid for in the long term. So services have got to meet the expectations of the people who use them, but also the environment's got to be able to support water and sanitation services in that long term. And that's why the new programs that DIVID is designing include sustainability at their core. And then finally, partnership is also critical, and next week, I'll be co-chairing the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation in Mexico, and that very much recognizes the importance of finance from a range of sources, whether it's domestic resources, private sector, donors, all coming together to meet development challenges. And that partnership is very much based on shared principles of country ownership, focus on results, inclusive partnership, uh, transparency and accountability. And I very much hope that we can all make sure that the outcomes of Paris, Busan, and the work of the global partnership to improve effectiveness in water and sanitation um, can be things that we all aim to achieve. Thank you. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think it's very good that you brought up the partnerships issue, uh, again, this horizontal approach. And I'm also glad you uh, reminded us that we have an ongoing negotiation now, uh, starting in New York on the sustainable, sustainable Development Goals. And of course, uh, the water and sanitation issue figures very high up on that agenda. And here I think we have to combine the beauty of the old the MDGs, which were in fact vertical and silos, but still extremely solid and very measurable, very concrete, with this view that I claim is so important, namely that it connects to other areas. So th this is gonna be a great uh, challenge to both get this these earlier standalone goals, which had that, that sort of visibility and concreteness, but also see, make sure that we see the dynamics of connecting to other sectors. That plus the institution aspect, I, say, I think are some of the major challenges in those negotiations for the member states, and I hope that you get involved in this process that goes on in New York. Uh, thank you very much. Now I'll turn to uh, 
Another friend, uh, we meet on so many barricades in life, don't we? Uh, Pekka Havist and I, we worked uh, with Darfur. I was a UN envoy, you, you were the European Union envoy, and now you are the Minister of Finland. And I know that you personally and politically are very interested in the uh, equality issues. Inequality is, is something that you have always had a, as a theme politically. Could you give an e equality or inequality perspective on the water issue? Yeah. Thank you, Jan. Thank you for this opportunity to, to address this um, audience on this uh, topic. First, let me, let me uh, continue with the topic of the MDGs and post-2015. I, I think it has been a success story what we have done with the water and sanitation and, and let us guarantee that this success story continues. And, and, and again, I, I see some kind of triangle there between the water and sanitation, the health and the environment, and, and we should really look this as a in a holistic way. And particularly when we, when we think countries uh, where the girls, uh, women are in a vulnerable position and where we have been supporting the schooling of the women, uh, the young, young girls and, and so on, we, we know how important the water and sanitation aspect is, is there, whether it's Afghanistan or, or, or other countries where, where really our common effort has been to, to support the role of the women. Uh, Finland has had a very good experiences to work in countries like Nepal and Ethiopia where really, really the access to water and sanitation has been one of the universal goals in, in, in these countries. And our new commitment will be for the years 2014-2016 to, to, to support to, to get access or give access to water and sanitation for one million additional uh, people. And when we are dealing with our partners, I think in Kenya, the water services uh, 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 trust fund uh, nationally has been very effective in Ethiopia, the One Wash national program in Nepal, actually the, the work that has been done with the vulnerable groups and, and ethnic groups and, and to access for these to these uh, services. And Afghanistan, of course, I, we, we belong to those countries that still continue particularly to support to the girl and women in Afghanistan in this uh, new situation where, where uh, ISAF is withdrawing and I think the development component is coming more and more stronger. And finally, the inclusiveness of, of different groups in a, in a development, whether we speak about the girl, women, other vulnerable groups, ethnic minorities, uh, disabled people and others, I think we should look also the, the rights for water and sanitation from the human rights perspective in, in this. Thank you. Much. I worked for a prime minister once who said that the, the best way to judge uh, the quality of society is to look at how the, the society deals with the most vulnerable, the poorest. Uh, that, to me, that's pretty good measurement. Uh, we should keep that in mind in the area of water and sanitation also. You mentioned Nepal, and here we will break from the uh, intergovernmental uh, direction we're going and ask... Uh, uh, Mr. Mrs. Lajana Manandar, Executive Director of the Lumanti Non-Governmental Organization in Nepal, to comment on the role of the civil society in this partnership that this meeting uh, represents. Are you here? Yes. Yeah. There you are. Yeah, thank you. Chair and honorable ministers, yeah, first of all, on behalf of the global civil society engaged in the sector, I would like to thank SWA Partnership for recognizing the important role played by the civil society organizations and giving us a space in this important high-level high level partnership platform. SWA partnership has a dream, a dream of universal access to WASH for everyone. And I think the partnership is making a demand and demand is creating a pressure on all of us to act together and not only to act together, but to act fast, very fast to achieve this dream. As a result, many important commitments are being made by our governments, and we greatly welcome these commitments, but the challenge lies in realizing these commitments, and we all know this. And this is where the civil society has an important contribution to make at the local level, national level, and also at the global level. At the local level, we work with the people who are the heart of the SWA partnership, and one of the key agenda of the partnership is to eliminate inequality, and we have been hearing all about this since yesterday, and to bring was facility at the doorsteps of the needy people. Civil society is the one who can best reach out to them and help the vulnerable to have a voice 
and claim their rights. And at the national level, we work with the concerned ministries to raise the profile of water, sanitation, and hygiene within the governmental priorities. And at the same time, we assist with careful monitoring to make sure that the commitments are fulfilled and the services are sustainable for the poor people. At the global level, we are the voice of the most vulnerable, the most marginalized, and the poorest. We take in information from the global level, carry it to the grassroots level, and again link our national efforts back to the global. Overall, we, the civil society organizations, are essential partners and work with others to keep the ball rolling until we achieve our common goal, and that is universal access to water, sanitation, and hygiene, and that means bringing a life and dignity to the people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we should definitely uh, see the role of civil society, because to me they symbolize the uh, necessity that whatever we decide in uh, global organizations like the United Nations really doesn't count if it is not translated to the uh, ground, to the field. Let's just remember the first three words of the UN Charter, is we the peoples. Uh, therefore, to uh, have uh, the non-government organizations, the civil society as a partner in this project is absolutely vital. I myself was chair of Water Aid Sweden, and uh, I'm very happy for that period. And that was the reason I was asked to be a Millennium Development Goal advocate by Pres the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. I don't know whether that contributed to him asking me to take this job, but anyway, there is a relationship. Uh, between uh, what we do with Ban governments and, of course, a very clear one with, uh, with the uh, civil society. Thank you very much. I know we have the Minister of Finance in Nepal in the room. Uh, I don't know whether you want to add something to this or, or whether we can proceed. Yes, if you could briefly just uh, add something from the governmental perspective. Chairman, uh, I'm pleased to report to you that uh, despite prolonged conflict, uh, instability, and low growth, Nepal has substantial made substantial progress in meeting the Millennium Development Goals with regard to WASP. In fact, uh, we have surpassed the global commitment both in water supply. We cover against the target of 73% of the population. We have made progress to cover 85% of the population. In water supply and sanitation, uh, we achieved 62% coverage against the target of 53%. Uh, and I'm delighted to, to share with you that the sanitation social program movement is going on full swing by the self-motivation and leadership of local bodies with full support of multi-stakeholders. Multi While there has been such impressive progress in the past, over the last few years, 15% of the population, namely 4 million, still don't have access to basic drinking water supply, whereas one-third of the population, 9 million, is still difficult openly in polluting our environment. Moreover, there are disparity between districts, ecological zones, caste, and ethnicity. We have as many as 11 districts, mostly from hills and mountains, that have less than 75% water supply coverage. In case of sanitation, there are 14 districts having less than 35% coverage. In order to overcome these challenges, the government is committed and firm to move wash sector towards swap arrangement programming approach in line with aid effectiveness principle. The funding need until the year 2017 is 2.349 billion US dollar. Government is committed to provide 0.365 million, the funding gap is approximately 1.9 billion US dollar. The focus in the coming years will be on water supply coverage 93 percent until 55, uh, uh, by the year 2017 we will have universal access to basic water and sanitation. We expect generous support from the international community to meet the funding gap we have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I understand that the Minister of uh, Finance of Madagascar has to leave very soon, has asked to uh, come in.
briefly here, and uh, I know that you are in favor of strengthening local government. And this is an aspect of our work which I think is absolutely crucial. How do we reach out to local government? And maybe you would like to say something about uh, your perspective on this subject. And I know you will speak in French, will you not? In French. So uh, prepare. It is uh, channel 11 for French for the English speakers only. S'il vous plaît, Monsieur Monsieur le Ministre, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Monsieur le Vice-Secrétaire Général, de m'avoir donné la parole. Comme vous le savez, Madagascar vient de élire son président. Donc, euh, euh, nous sommes heureux de revenir dans le cercle des nations. Donc, merci à vous de nous avoir euh, invités. Donc, euh, dans le domaine du secteur de l'eau, d'assainissement et d'hygiène, le gouvernement de Madagascar est conscient des effets néfastes du manque de services d'eau et d'assainissement pour la population malgache. Cela génère une perte de 103 millions de dollars, dont 48 à cause de la défécation à l'air libre. Nous voulons donc changer complètement cette situation. À ce titre, trois changements clés seront apportés. Le premier, c'est de mettre le secteur de l'eau, de l'assainissement et de l'hygiène comme l'un des priorités dans la stratégie de développement de Madagascar. Cela se traduirait par une augmentation du budget en faveur du secteur dès cette année 2014. Le deuxième changement, c'est que, avant 2016, la gestion du budget sera décentralisée et déconcentrée vers les 22 régions de l'île. Le troisième changement, donc à titre de pilote, dans les deux années à venir, 100 communes seront dotées d'un service technique pérenne de l'eau, de l'assainissement et de l'hygiène. Ces services techniques auront donc pour objectif d'assurer la durabilité de services au niveau local et aussi de favoriser l'accès universel de la population dans, pour ces services avant 2025. Par ailleurs, la décentralisation de contrôle et le renforcement des capacités au niveau local vont nous permettre de, premièrement, de doter les services territoriaux déconcentrés des instruments de planification, de mise en œuvre, de suivi et de régulation du domaine de l'eau et de l'assainissement. Deuxièmement, d'asseoir un système de financement viable des services d'eau et d'assainissement au niveau local à travers les fameux 3D, c'est-à-dire le transfert des fonds par le gouvernement central, la tarification des services et aussi la taxation locale. Et troisièmement, pour finir, instaurer un système de redevabilité de gouvernants à tous les niveaux vis-à-vis -vis des services, vis-à-vis -vis des usagers aussi, des services d'eau et d'assainissement. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's interesting you pointed to this. Uh, if you want to decentralize both control and capacity to local levels for water and sanitation, you immediately have to face the issue of uh, financing, whether the, gov the central government will then provide those means or whether you can ha institute local taxation. That's not an easy thing uh, for <laughs> ministers of finance, is it? I spent some time in the Minister of Finance also, so I know. But uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, model that you have uh, explained to us. Uh, I now have, um, uh, I want to invite Mrs. Sada Mkoyasalo, Minister of Finance of Tansa Tanzania, to speak. Uh, Minister, uh, Tanzania has prioritized making services sustainable by separating service delivery and regulatory functions. We've been touching on that. Please tell us a bit about how you intend to go about this. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Secretary General and uh, Honorable Ministers and distinguished candidates. Of course, uh, water and sanitation continue to be priority in, in Tanzania National Development Plan as well as strategies and policies that embedded into the sector. But uh, by, by separating, um, separating the service delivery as well as regula regulatory function, Tanzania has uh, uh, 
just want to ensure that water, water user groups, water user associations, and private operators operate with the level of autonomy uh, required. We just don't want this um, regulatory function to intervene to, to those uh, service delivery function. But in, in, order, in order to encourage good management and prevent uh, uh, excessive profiteering of only uh, a specific group of operators, we will be also uh, develop standard contracts to ensure that this is, uh, is done efficiently. But then we also want to establish rural water management models, which is uh, in which this, uh, the Minister of Water in, co in collaboration with the uh, Prime Minister's office, which is, which is uh, the, the, the office that uh, teaches regional administration and local government will supervise the recruitment of uh, registrars and local government authorities. This is, will be done by uh, 2016. But also, also these uh, registrar will be, will be responsible for the registration of these uh, community-owned water supply organization that we call them as cold, so cold stops. Yeah, the, the, the community, uh, community owned water supply organization. So uh, this is just to ensure that water is really accessible and maintained at a very, very, very uh, local level. Tanzania's now accessibility to water is 54%, which is uh, in the rural area, but we just want to make this uh, available to those rural area by ensuring the autonomous op operation toward this. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, I know a lot about this because I was traveling with Salim Salim and the, uh, we were mediating the Darfur crisis and we saw the drought and we, he explained the situation in Tanzania in detail to me, so good luck with this work. Uh, I, I now turn to uh, uh, my another friend, Dr. Raj, Raj Shah, uh, known to many of you, the administrator of USAID. If you could give some brief remarks from the perspective of aid, if aid effectiveness, uh, to what degree is a body like this, the Sanitation Water for All, uh, a tool for you in the perspective of aid effectiveness and partnerships? Uh, if you could spend a few minutes, two, min two or three minutes on that, we'd be grateful. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Under Secretary General, for your uh, incredible leadership and for making, uh, for helping us all come together to recognize how central investments in water, sanitation, and hygiene are, especially for achieving uh, core goals on behalf of women and girls, on behalf of economic opportunity, and critically important on behalf of children, uh, child survival, and nutrition. I would just note that in the four-year period from 2005 to 2008, the United States uh, spent $1.4 billion on water and sanitation and hygiene efforts. And when compared with uh, the next four-year period from 2009 to 2012, that number went up by a billion dollars to $2.4 billion. And the reason for that increase, which is significant at a time when overall budgets in development and global health uh, for the United States have been relatively consistent, has been a reallocation of funds to those activities that have the highest cost effectiveness for achieving the core goals that were discussed. And so the, we're actually very proud of the fact that between the 2009 and 2012 period, uh, our total funding allowed us to reach 36 million people with water, sanitation, and hygiene interventions. Uh, and those were uh, mostly new uh, people who we hadn't previously reached before in very resource poor settings. So in that context, when we went about creating a water, sanitation, and hygiene strategy, the goal was to define a measurement framework that allowed us to link our investments to results, to identify a partnership framework that recognized that almost uh, that the majority of resources going towards these efforts come from countries themselves and we play a modest but sometimes catalytic role and to explore unique efforts to bring new science and technology ranging from improved and low-cost water filtration to public-private partnerships that help to distribute different forms of water purification. I just want to highlight that in preparation for today, we wanted to highlight a few core commitments we can make. The first is uh, USAID will plan to reach 6 million additional individuals with sustainable access to improved sanitation by 2018, over, over and above our current levels by ramping up our sanitation programming in 12 countries. 
we also will develop a knowledge platform around sustained water and sanitation services to help learn in that context. And we're proud of our partnerships with the Gates Foundation and the World Bank uh, and UNICEF in that regard. And third, USAID is committed to making its nutrition investments more effective by integrating key hygiene elements into the thousand days programs that Tony is here, that Tony has helped lead on all of our behalfs. And I think for all of the work that we do in this space, the recognition that integrating these efforts gets us the best value for money, especially against saving children's lives, very much motivates what we do. So thank you for the opportunity to be with you and, and thank you for your great leadership here. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think I mentioned uh, the uh, call for action that we launched last year for sanitation. I really would like to appeal for your help on this. The Secretary didn't ask me to, uh, to launch this appeal uh, for, for action on sanitation. It, if we can succeed in really giving a boost to the work on sanitation, we could achieve something important which even will affect the negotiations on the uh, next goals and targets. Namely, we could prove that we can indeed accelerate the achievement of the MDGs. If sanitation is the most lagging, let us prove that we can do it. And I, I know USAID is, is very much behind this, but also I hope all of you see the merits of doing this, not only from the perspective of helping people in the world uh, who are suffering, but also that by this we could really send a very important signal. You can make a difference. Now I'll turn to uh, Dr. Chris Elias, President of Global Development of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, your commitments, uh, include resources to develop new tools and new approaches to address uh, the challenge of containing and treating human waste. Uh, could you uh, briefly tell us something about this? Sure, thank you, Deputy <coughs> Secretary General. Um, for all the reasons you've heard, the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation makes significant investments in water sanitation and hygiene to complement our other um, uh, programs in global health and development. Um, and recently, we've had a particular focus on urban sanitation. You've heard about the problems of open defecation in rural areas. Uh, somewhat underappreciated is the problem in urban areas, where, where many people use toilets, but there are 2.1 billion people using toilets that are not connected uh, to, to safe sewer systems, and where they're connected to pits or latrines that aren't emptied regularly or are systems that discharge the raw sewage and fecal sludge into the environment. So as a, as a consequence, we're making significant investments to develop new tools for containing and treating human waste. We focus on urban sanitation and non-sewered uh, uh, approaches because retrofitting uh, large and rapidly growing urban areas with sewers is not only very expensive, but it's very, very difficult to do. Additionally, non-sewered sanitation systems present actual viable business opportunities for entrepreneurs who can capture energy in the form of electricity, biochar, biogas, biodiesel, and convert fecal sludge into fertilizer and other soil amendment products uh, that may benefit agriculture. Uh, we're probably best known for our reinvent the toilet challenge. In fact, just a few weeks ago, together with the governor of India's Department of Biotechnology, we hosted the second reinvent the toilet fair in New Delhi, and we're able to see some considerable progress in, in engineering solutions that can help bring us closer to a transformative technology that would benefit probably first um, urban sanitation, but then ultimately rural sanitation as well. We're all also investing in better emptying and processing technologies. And while that we think those technological innovations will ultimately be transformative, we recognize they're not the only answer. We're gonna need innovations, as many have talked about in business models and public-private partnerships to ultimately bring sanitation to everyone and to make it not no longer the, the, the lagging MDG indicator. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think your comments uh, are relevant from many perspectives, but one of them is, of course, the, uh, the uh, very rapid urbanization going on. We heard the figures, uh, was it 70% 70, 70 in some years' time, but already today, almost 60% uh, or is approaching that. And of course, the sanitation challenges and the infrastructure challenges are enormous. Mostly, uh, unfortunately, poor people who move from rural areas to uh, poor countries, urban areas, and there is no infrastructure. And you have this creation of slums. And the two or three cholera outbreaks that we have seen uh, recently actually are in those environments. So here we have a huge challenge. 
And if you add to that the water scarcity problem, we can't have a system where people flush 46 liters per person every time they go in the toilet. It, we, we gotta have new solutions, so I'm very glad you, you are moving in that direction. Uh, now I wish to invite Dr. Kaifala Mara, Minister of Finance and Economic Development of Sierra Leone. Uh, sanitation often suffers from weak leadership. Uh, of course, nothing of this is represented in this room, uh, I'm sure. Uh, I know Sierra Leone is making good progress on sanitation. Can you tell us how you are leading s sanitation and what additional plans and commitments you are tabling in 2014? Now, let me generally congratulate Sierra Leone for what you have achieved in the last few years. We actually closed our peacekeeping operation there because we had done our job and you had done our job. It was one of the happiest moments for Ban Ki-moon uh, this year, with a year of bad news, but we really congratulate Sierra Leone for your work and give you all the support, uh, would give you all support in the continued efforts of the country. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Moderator. Um, excellencies, colleagues, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon. As required, let me make it short. When we put together the agenda for prosperity that will take us from 2013 through to 2018, we decided to prioritize sanitation and hygiene. And so, therefore, it happens to be one of the flagship projects now being driven by the president himself. Um, at sector level, led by the Ministry of Health and Sanitation in collaboration with the Water Resources Ministry. Ministry of Finance provides support. This is part of the Free Healthcare Initiative introduced by His Excellency the President helping pregnant women, lactating mothers, and children under the age of five. So it is uh, an, an addition to that strategy. So what we have decided to do is to establish a whole directorate responsible for sanitation and hygiene. And one of the key action points that we have taken is to um, train 230 public health aides that will now be deployed in respective and um, communities across the country. I must say that um, the government is doing this in collaboration with development partners, as well as the civil society. But it must be said that um, the role of partners have been very, very phenomenal. I wouldn't say they have taken the lead, but their role in this particular um, um, initiative have been very, very um, um, phenomenal. Now we are aware that um, to scale up sanitation and hygiene is just a way of scaling up the potential of developing the next generation. But it meant also that um, government should be able to up resources. And so we have made a commitment that um, going forward, government will continue to increase resource allocation to this particular initiative. The strategy is as we are moving out of conflict and as the UN you know, has win of win us up and that we are making progress, we want to ensure that we take our destiny in our own hands, but ensuring that we invest in areas that are as strategic as sanitation and hygiene. So it is a commitment of government and we'll continue to work with partners in that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we should uh, try to, to have a system of bringing in the good examples. You know, when things work, uh, we could have a system of uh, picking up those ideas. Maybe we also need uh, to have a, a bank of uh, failed attempts also to <laughs> warn us from not entering that area. But I think uh, this type of meeting really gives ideas for some several of us to, to pursue uh, on, our, uh, on, on other paths. Uh, I visited Afghanistan uh, last year and I was very happy to meet with the Minister of Finance, Dr. Hazrat Omar Sa Sakilwal, uh, and uh, uh, first of all, congratulation, congratulations to the elections and uh, we hope that you will continue the road now to uh, peaceful uh, development in your country and uh, 
it would be, of course, of interest to have uh, the, the perspective from your country on the road ahead that you see in this area. Please. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Um, and um, let me also thank the organizers for allowing us to be part of this important discussion. Um, water and sanitation um, from the very outset of our development agenda in the past 12 years has been um, a priority, um, priority of the government um, and priority of the people. And it still continues to be a topic uh, that comes up not only sort of in its own context, but also um, again when we discuss health priorities and water and sanitation certainly becomes a topic that's relevant. Um, and when we discuss rural development again, um, it's prominently there, um, but it's also there um, in our development agenda in its own right. Um, the, there has been uh, certainly on, on, on access to clean and drinking water, um, um, uh, significant progress, um, both in, or mostly in rural, but also in urban areas. Um, in rural areas, uh, through the Ministry of uh, Rural Rehabilitation and Development, I'm glad to see the minister with us, and of course, um, he will have his own opportunity uh, to discuss the specifics there. Um, in addition um, to uh, water and sanitation to be an independent or sort of in its own right, um, a uh, development um, program within the Ministry of Rural Deha Rehabilitation, um, other programs that are delivered um, by the Ministry of Rural um, Development, such as the National Solidarity Program, which is community-owned development program, a very high percentage of the allocation uh, there um, by the community was devoted um, to, to clean drinking water. Um, and as a result of this, a very high percentage compared to what it used to be now closer to 50% of the population um, have access to clean uh, drinking water. The issue with water, um, as I'm sure would be the case with others, is not just um, the initial investment, but also the sustainability of this. Um, the good thing, again, uh, with our um, rural development experience is that giving the ownership to community ensures the sustainability. Um, so the spending there, whether it's through the water and sanitation program or whether it's been through the national solidarity program or another program which call it the national area-based development program. Some 30% of, of these other programs, resources have, were also devoted by the communities as we let the communities develop their own priority list and, and implement them were spent on, on clean drinking water. Um, Within, again, the urban areas, um, the Ministry of Urban Development were responsible for that, but what we did was, of course, for sustainability purpose, we needed a reform there, and as a result of, of the reform initiative, we were able to um, take the, the Department of, of, of Water and Sanitation, or we call it the Water and Canalization, out of that ministry and, and turned it into a corporation so that it can run on a sort of on a fee basis so that it can sustain itself. The good news is that that organization right now generates enough to, to sustain um, um, uh, its, its current operation and hopefully we will get to the point that it can not only sustain but also from generating revenue it, it could invest back into, um, into its own, um, the delivery of its services. Um, not only the, the um, access figures, um, access to clean um, drinking water is certainly a lot higher in the past 10 years of, of investments in both rural um, and um, 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 urban, uh, but the improvement in the health indicators um, certainly, of course, also benefited from, from clean drinking water, uh, whether that's the child mortality rate if we uh, look into that or, or, or maternal mortality rate have had a positive um, impact on that. Um, again, keeping the time in mind, um, I'll, 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 I'll um, stop there, but the challenge that we have, and I'll, I'll have to leave it with the challenge, is the canalization or the sanitation part. Um, we still have to find um, more innovative uh, um, ways 
um, to to um, uh, deliver um, the sanitation and canalization, particularly in, in inner cities, in a more affordable prices, which we have not really yet discovered, um, but we certainly, in these sort of meetings, um, could benefit from the experiences of, of countries where it has succeeded. Thank you very much. I, I think you, you know how strongly the world hopes that the uh, Afghan people will meet another future than they have faced for so many years. Uh, and uh, I have been chairing a group for the post-2014 development of Afghanistan. Health and education are, of course, sectors that we will continue in. So I hope that you will, in contact with our colleagues in uh, Kabul, uh, bring out these uh, aspects to, to them so that we can work together on this, in this field. Thank you. I have two more remaining on the list, and uh, I think we are probably going to be coming to the end, but uh, if, if they are dealing as strictly with time as their successes, we, their predecessors, we could probably make it. Mr. Takeshi Osuga, uh, you are representing the Japanese government and one of the most generous uh, donors to the war sectors. Do you plan to, if I may put it directly, maintain your level of support for the future? Are you here? Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Secretary General. Um, I'm responding on behalf of my minister, uh, uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, who also mm -hmm. covers the mandate of development uh, cooperation. Um, water is essential for life, a foundation of social development and a vital element for ensuring human security. With this conviction, Japan places great emphasis on water and sanitation in, in its ODA policies and has been the largest donor in this field since the 1990s. For instance, at the 5th Tokyo International Conference on African Development, TCAT 5, held last year, uh, Japan pledged to contribute to the improvement of access to safe drinking water and sanitary conditions for 10 million people, as well as the human resource development of 1,750 water supply engineers over the five years from 2013 to 2017. Um, another way, uh, very important uh, development agenda for Japan is to achieve a society where all women shine. Um, at the UN General Assembly last September, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe pledged to implement ODA in excess of three billion US dollars over the three years from 2013 to 2015 towards women's empowerment and gender equality. Japan's ODA on water and sanitation will be delivered in such a way that it will facilitate <coughs> and promote women's active role and participation in society. Japan's ODA on water and sanitation in 2013 is estimated to be at least 2.3 billion US dollars, including 490 million US dollars for African countries. Japan will continue its cooperation in this sector to fulfill the needs of people in developing countries by making the best use of Japan's experience, expertise, and technology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I, c I, I read that as continued commitment, and I thank you very much for that. Uh, and now last uh, intervention on my list, and uh, unfortunately I think due to time for this uh, part of the meeting is to Sweden. Uh, Mari Ottosson, Director of International Organizations at SIDA, uh, uh, the Swedish Development Agency. Sweden has made a substantial commitment. Can you just in a minute or so uh, uh, can give an account for what you would we like to see part of that, what, what the elements would be of that commitment? Thank you very much, Deputy Se Secretary General. And to understand how our funds will be invested, I would like to give some examples of how Sweden works and of our priorities. Sweden supports global efforts towards achieving universal access to water, sanitation and hygiene by eliminating inequalities and ensuring sustainability. But we work both broadly and horizont horizontally. And our support and our investments will be at the global level, at the regional level, and at the bi bilateral level, as well as down to the local level. And we do this in order to promote an efficient and sustainable and equitable use of the water resources, 
as well as affordable technology options and, of course, innovations, which is something that we are putting more and more attention to. And we will, of course, also support gender equality, women and children's rights. And the allocations to be made, they will be based on the anticipated expected outcomes of WASH, for example, such as an improved use of safe drinking water, improved sanitation access, healthy environments and improved hygiene practices, and also an enhanced support for women, children and families. And thirdly, an increased support towards strengthening national capacity, and that, with that comes, of course, accountability, legislation, etc. But we would also like to put emphasis on the need and importance of developing a proper and efficient monitoring system, as well as measurable indicators in all programs, not only so we can measure pro progress, but in order to properly assess the quality, not just the quantities, of the services delivered, as well as the outreach of the funds to marginal marginalized groups. By this we mean uh, people with disabilities, women and children, the elderly, the LGBT community, hence the overall impact of the program supported. And we will be working along with our partners and maintaining close dialogue with them in order to follow up on these pro uh, processes. And finally, I would like to emphasize that we have heard today earlier that this is not only a sound financial in, uh, investment, even though it will be a high return on investment. But apart from that, we must also take into consideration that the social, health, as well as environmental positive externalities and the results and impacts that arise from supporting WASH programs make this type of support highly relevant in the fight against corruption. So Sweden remains committed to the WASH. Thank you. Good to end on that note. And I want to apologize to the participants who were not able to speak due to time constraints. Uh, I know many of you uh, have made commitments uh, presented yesterday, and I regret that you could not elaborate on this at this meeting. But I think we covered a lot of territory, as one says, and uh, uh, this thing, I also want to say that we have um, several donors at development banks making significant financial commitments who have not spoken here, including Switzerland, Netherlands, Austria, France, and the African Development Bank. So uh, I, I want you to recognize your, your contributions. And just say to you, this has been a very illuminating discussion. I think we have covered the subject from so many different directions, and I think there's unity that we should go for um, uh, living up to the vision of a univer universal access. We'll see how the negotiations go in New York. I'm sure that you will follow this. Uh, we uh, have, are committed to reducing inequalities. Uh, we have spoken very concretely about uh, sanitation for all and eliminating open defecation. And uh, we have uh, made commitments uh, to spend more money and also to spend the money we have more wisely. And I would stress very much to build institutions. And the last uh, thing I would just like to appeal to you is, uh, since I'm based in New York, uh, even if I'm traveling a lot, uh, the negotiations on the next generation goals goes on there. I just want to appeal to you to bring home to your governments, bring, bring, bring home to your institutions, bring home to the public opinion in your country, the work on the next stage, the next goals and targets that we set. We, without the support of you, finance ministers, ministers of sanitation, ministers of economic planning, these goals will not be as substantive and, and be translated to the national and local scene. So I, I really hope that you will follow the, 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 the continued negotiations in New York and bring in your views and make sure that you yourself bring out to your own countries and in the both national context and local context, context translate this to change and change in a, in, a, in a way which will make life different for millions and millions of people. And from this room we can, we can start these movements and we can get things done. So I thank you very much for giving us, in fact, not only 55 but 60 mm -hmm. minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Secretary General Eliasson. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we had hoped to have the, uh, the minister from Rwanda, uh, Minister Gatetti, joining us. 
and we can't find the minister. If there's someone from uh, the audience who would like to come up and represent uh, the developing world, we would love to have you, and I will simply stand up at the microphone. I know that this is a little bit of a curveball, <laughs> but who's brave enough to come up here <laughs> and sit? Anyone? No. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I'm giving you my chair. Fine. I'll sit back down. <laughs> so thank you. I wanted to let you know that this discussion uh, is about reaching everyone and making services last, eliminating inequalities, and achieving institutional and technical sustainability. We have on the far left of the stage Katerina del Albuquerque, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights to Safe Water and Sanitation. Sitting next to her is Keith Weed, who is the Chief Marketing and Communication Officer of Unilever. And finally, uh, but not least, we have uh, Minister Ms. Lillian Plumen, who is the Minister of Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation from the Netherlands. Uh, let me begin with, uh, with you, Minister Plumen. What are the ways in which donors can realistically invest in core country systems and at the same time ensure that the focus uh, is on infrastructure, capacity building, and reaching the core? We heard, we heard so much today about the importance of sustainability. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Very happy to uh, see you all here uh, while we're discussing the important issue of uh, universal access to water and the management, responsible management of water, which I think for any government in any country of the world remains a challenge um, uh, and uh, an issue where I think all of us uh, need to share lessons uh, and learn lessons from each other. The Netherlands has been investing uh, in our own uh, systems in our country for decades, but we've also been investing in systems in some of the countries that are represented here, uh, around $100 million a year is our contribution, and we're very much dedicated to continue to keep up that investment. Let me say that first. Uh, secondly, we're very happy also uh, with the Secretariat of Sanitation and Water that's being set up. Uh, we are contributing uh, to that, which is good news, but even Better news for, I think, much of the audience here is that we will sign the agreement uh, during a soccer match between uh, Ghana uh, and the Netherlands in a few weeks. So mm -hmm. if you manage to get tickets, I would invite, come, please come, because it will be a challenging uh, match combining the important issue and, and promoting the important issue of access to water with what is close to uh, our heart being uh, winners of the World Championship in Brazil this summer. <laughs> anyway, um, having said that, I think we learned three uh, lessons, sometimes the hard way, so I really want to share them with you. Okay. One is that um, it's key to uh, place sustainability at the core of our joint efforts which means that all of us need to be very conscious of the role of local governments, uh, again, in my own country, but also in many of uh, the other countries represented here. So uh, technical assistance, working together on the level of local government, uh, exchanging practices would be key. The second uh, lesson that we learned is that um, uh, if, if you don't um, uh, put sustainability at the heart of the agreements that you make with the different parties that are involved in access, uh, gain, getting access uh, in, uh, uh, to water, then it will be lost somewhere. So we are putting in our contracts a sustainability clause okay. that says we're going to negotiate with all involved as part of the signing of the contract how the next 10 years we can keep up the efforts, which I think is uh, a call uh, to action that I would like to make to all of you uh, to include also a sustainability clause and we're very happy to share how we are doing that. Um, and my third and last point would be, and Unilever at the stage uh, is point in case, I would say is uh, include the private sector um, uh, because the private sector has a lot of experiences uh, to share. They're a key partner, I would say, in inclusive economic growth. <coughs> Uh, very interesting uh, um, experiences in public pro partner, uh, private partnerships 
around water, which really strengthen, I would say, the efforts of all involved. So uh, here's the three lessons that we learned uh, and uh, very much willing and eager to hear the lessons of all of you so that we can make this work uh, the coming years because obviously also post 2015, uh, access to uh, universal access to water will be a challenge that we need to work on together. I'm curious for, for those of you in the audience, how many of you have received money from the government of the Netherlands with that 10 year sustainability clause? Could you just raise your hand? Yeah? Mm. Okay. It, and are you happy? And are you happy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, I'd like to turn to you, um, Ms. de Albuquerque, and uh, ask you about the role that you envision governments and donors playing in uh, reducing inequalities. Um, in eliminating inequalities, yes, please. Yes, eliminating, <laughs> yes, let's, let's talk about elimination. At least progressively, but Absolutely. elimination of inequalities. Yeah. Well, I see four important uh, measures. Um, first, adopting legislation, having le regulatory frameworks, and also recognizing at the national level, as many of you have done, the human rights to water and sanitation. This is a crucial step, the legislative framework, to ensure then accountability, and I will talk about accountability later. Identify, then the other thing is have the data. Identify who has been left behind. Collect the data, disaggregate the data. Who has access to water and sanitation in rural areas and in urban areas, in formal settlements and in, in formal settlements among persons with disabilities and persons without disabilities, ethnic minorities and, and the rest of the population. So this is crucial and in this context, I don't see Dr. Cenk uh, in the room uh, from WHO anymore, but I wanted to congratulate WHO on, on the GLASS report uh, that we received um, uh, the, uh, yesterday. Uh, because I think it brings us uh, fantastic data uh, on inequalities and I think that it is data that should be food for thought for all of us. For governments, for national governments, for donors, bilateral donors, multilateral donors, for everyone. Um, so that's one thing. And then the third thing is act upon the data that you have. Target the most marginalized, prioritize them, and be aware that because they, are, they don't have access or they have a lower uh, level of access, then the majority of the population or the other part of the population, these people here need more investments. We need a faster rate of progress to make them, to lift them up, to make them uh, at the same level as those who have um, and when you think of donors, uh, um, uh, Madam Minister, you inspired me. Um, because what I was going to say is that uh, go, uh, 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 donors should uh, uh, um, give funding according to human rights criteria. So you were talking about your famous sustainability clause. Well, I would call upon donors to also include an elimination of inequalities clause. Uh, in all uh, their um, support, uh, bilateral cooperation to other governments. And we heard some ni interesting things here in the room. I had heard some before, for example, DFID, that decided to integrate an elimination of discrimination against women clause mm -hmm. in their work. Mm -hmm. Switzerland, uh, the Swiss Development Cooperation Agency, which has integrated the human rights to water and sanitation in all their projects. What Sweden just said, elimination of inequalities. I think this is, these are important examples, but I think they should become systematic for everyone. And, um, and uh, to, to conclude, account uh, well, to conclude on these four, four points, accountability <laughs> mechanisms, <laughs> set targets, set benchmarks, monitor progress or retrogressions, and include the elimination of inequalities in the post-2015 uh, uh, agenda. Without targeting the most marginalized, I've said it yesterday, I will say it again today, we will not get SWA, we will get SWS, sanitation and water for some, mm -hmm. and that's not what we want. Mm -hmm. We want the A, we don't want the S. Um, the benefits that we can get are innumerous, and, and this is the, re the reason for doing it, is because of the, the, uh, uh, the benefits that we can gain. Many of you have mentioned the, the benefits today and yesterday in the room, uh, but it's also the right thing to do from a human rights point of view, an ethical point of view, a moral point of view, it is smart. And inequalities are signal danger for long-term sustainable economic growth and democratic governance. Uh, human development, education, women's rights and dignity, as we know, are all promoted, but only when 
everyone has access to, to services, not only some. Thank you. We heard the mention there of, of MDGs, and I know, Keith, that Unilever has been representing the private sector in discussions at the UN around the post-2015 MDGs. Mm -hmm. My question for you is how you think the private sector can align its objectives with development goals, and it would be good to hear from you what the stumbling blocks are that you see towards improving sustainability of WASH, and how can the private sector contribute? I don't know if you have any examples that you could offer that would illustrate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone, and it's great to be here um, representing the private sector um, on a very important subject. And you talk about the Millennium Development Goals and the private sector. The first thing, I suppose, which is, a, which is an obvious point, um, it's, it's easier for the private sector to engage um, on Millennium Development Goals uh, if their portfolios uh, are in the area of some of those challenges. Mm. So Unilever is a good example of that. Uh, we we uh, develop and, and sell everyday products uh, around the world, uh, from soap to soup. Um, we are in 180 countries, and uh, every day 2 billion people use our products. So I say that because we are mass market. Um, and for the WASH agenda, I mean, that's really you know, very relevant to us because we um, produce products that uh, on one side clean toilets, uh, we have uh, home uh, water purifiers uh, that people can then get uh, safe drinking water uh, from, uh, right through then to soap uh, and, and hand washing. Uh, so the wash agenda is, is obviously very, uh, very close to some of the things that we strive to achieve um, uh, on an everyday basis. But as far as you're saying about some of the challenges, now I'll come on to some of the examples. Um, some of the challenges, well the first challenge is, is I think actually uh, the wash agenda as wash. Um, and I think it's much easier to engage intellectually and, of course, have a focus on some of the big infrastructure challenges uh, around sanitation and around water, you know, pipes and taps and, and sewers, etc. cetera. Um, and I think one of the challenges is the H of wash. Now, you said you were scared about losing the, uh, uh, the A to an S. Um, I'm scared of losing the H of uh, wash to was um, because uh, hygiene, I think, is an incredibly important part of, of wash. Um, and uh, it's, I think it's too uh, dangerous to just look at the first part because we t heard earlier about the 2,000 uh, children dying every day under the age of five. If we don't close that loop and get hand washing uh, and good basic hygiene in place, uh, then all the investment we put elsewhere won't actually uh, bring that, that, uh, that real challenge to a close. But if that wasn't already difficult enough, and I think uh, many of us try uh, uh, on an ongoing basis to integrate across wash, I think going a step further to integrate sun as well, nutrition, uh, scaling up nutrition, uh, because there's no point talking about nutrition uh, if then, of course, you have diarrhea um, uh, hand in hand uh, next door to it. So bringing those two together, I think, is another big challenge. And, uh, and I think that, to me, would be one of the, the big sort of challenges and obstacles is, is wash and then into, into nutrition. If I think another big challenge, and I'll give you a couple of examples, another big challenge uh, for me would be around the, the area of scaling. So I can think some really good examples of um, sort of uh, public-private partnerships uh, where we've done things uh, together, uh, but has it then been scaled and is it sustainable? And I've heard a lot of people talking about that. And there's been a lot of good projects in the private sector under the banner of CSR, Corporate and Social Responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to say at Unilever, I closed uh, that department down because as far as I was concerned, I don't think it should be separate. It should be in the core of the business um, and it should be how you do business, a sustainable way. So on top of looking at the environmental and social sustainability, how do you get the economic sustainability? And that's a huge, big uh, challenge to get really uh, ongoing business models um, that have a business case uh, from the private sector and not sort of charity or, or donation approach. And I think that's when it goes from the, the challenges, I think, into then some of the solutions. So some of the examples, I've got three just to... to um, to uh, help us sort of uh, get our mind around this. The three things that we think we can bring uh, and help from a private sector, the first, of course, is programs. And we've done some fantastic programs, for example, with Tony Lake, I see him sitting there, uh, and the great leadership that you've done uh, in UNICEF, and Unilever and UNICEF have done uh, a lot of programs. Even I started on the CATS program, the sanitation program, uh, where I think about the hand washing, we've also done with USAID, uh, or indeed with Gates, uh, some good, or PSI. The programs is part of it. Um, but if I go beyond programs, because you expect me to say that, uh, and start saying, what else can the private sector bring? 
I think the second point would be about awareness and advocacy. Mm. Now, we do a lot about awareness. You know, Unilever's the second largest advertiser in the world. We do a lot about talking to people around the world uh, about benefits, about desirability, about engaging people on topics. And how can we help bring awareness to some of these things? You know, everyone sniggers a little bit when you talk about toilets and poo and defecation in whichever country you're in, because it's a little bit uncomfortable. And I don't think it's a surprise that sanitation is one of the hardest ones we get going, because it's a little bit uncomfortable compared to talking about drinking water, which are much more positive uh, concepts. So I think you know, getting more positive awareness and bringing that, that uh, subject up, and then uh, combine that with advocacy as well. Um, and, and the reason why I'm here, and the reason why I was yesterday um, at the SWA meeting, and the reason why I talk at different uh, uh, panels and places around the world is saying, yes, if we can engage the, the private uh, and, and the public sector and get the government, get everyone together with civil society, I think we do have a real uh, ongoing opportunity to, to make this work. So if I give you one example where I think that um, ha has, has worked well as a, as a sort of an innovation uh, in this area, uh, I would say some of the stuff we're doing around behavioral change. Uh, and behavioral change is what we do every day. You know, I have 600 market research people around the world just studying how people do things, wash hair, wash hands, etc. And changing behavior is really, really difficult. You've all done it yourself. Have you ever tried changing a behavior? Have you ever tried that diet which you can never keep on or started to floss your teeth or all those behavior change things are difficult. Uh, and our belief is if you don't do something for 21 days, it doesn't stick. And I've got a lot of scientific sort of evidence within our business to show that. 21 days, that's a long time to hold someone to a new uh, bit of behavior. So we look at the five levers of change, which are, uh, make it um, uh, easy to under understand. So understands the first. Uh, easy is the second. Uh, reward is the third. Uh, desirable is the fourth. And fifth is to make it a habit. Uh, and we've done a lot of work uh, with a lot of uh, really excellent NGOs in this area, um, uh, really trying to drive the idea of behavior change. Because actually, if you give someone a toilet, and we heard them earlier, and they end up being used as storing grain, uh, or if you ask people to change their habits and it doesn't stick, uh, and we put in uh, sanitation, but people then don't wash their hands, uh, we can't close that, cir that circuit. So um, I think innovation in behavior change is an exciting area that we can do a lot more, and it's, it's what I do as a day job at the end of the day, uh, in selling uh, Ben and Jerry's through to uh, Lipton Tea. Uh, we're about behavior change. Well, I think you can, you feel the energy up here, and whether it's talking about uh, spreading the word on sustainability clauses, creating a new uh, inequality clause, or innovation in behavior change, I think that Hopefully we can harness this energy and uh, spread the word and plow forward as we push for SWA and not SWS. Uh, and with that, I want to hand things over to the SWA chair, President Kufour, for some closing remarks. Thank you, Madam Moderator. And I want to take this opportunity to commend you for an excellent job done moderating this large and demanding meeting. I see many politicians here, and for you to have succeeded in keeping the meeting under control all this time uh, shows that you are quite a, a formidable moderator. We congratulate you. At the beginning of this meeting, I, I challenge the ministers here to make concrete and practical commitments. And that's exactly what I've heard. You have acknowledged the challenges you face in your respective countries, even as you've told us about the progress you have made since 2012. And you've also told us what you are going to do to continue to make strides. I'm happy that so many commitments focused on building capacity in country. And that's Many of you focused on the need to establish and build the institutions necessary to reach everyone with water, sanitation, and hygiene. We have heard from donors and development agencies that they will stay the course and work beside us, maintaining their support for our efforts. I look forward to our next gathering 
In the meantime, we'll continue to track progress against the commitments made today and to hold each other accountable within the partnership which is growing. And I want to thank all of you for making this meeting and this partnership such a success. I'm now more confident than ever that our name, Sanitation and Water for All, will become our achievement. And with this, I say Godspeed. Thank you very much.